Thank you, David. I gotta get my stuff right here. But it is Advent season, so welcome again to Advent at Seawee Bay as I light the second candle of our Advent, the candle of faith. I want to I want you to allow me just a few moments to just remove any assumptions that there may be that everyone knows about the Advent season. There isn't anything within God's word about honoring Advent. According to historians, the Advent season began between the 4th and 5th century as a time for fasting and prayer during the month of December and to celebrate both Christ's birth as well as his return. The symbols of this season are usually a wreath with four to five candles within it. And the Advent wreath was created out of green, symbolizing everlasting life in the midst of winter and death, as the evergreen is continuously green. This circle of the wreath reminds us of God's unending love and the eternal life he makes possible. The first candle which we lit last week was symbolizing hope, and it's also called the prophet's candle. Prophets of the Old Testament, especially Isaiah, waited in hope for the Messiah's arrival. The second candle which I lit today represents faith and is called the Bethlehem's candle. Micah had foretold that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which was also the birthplace of King David. The third candle symbolizes joy and is called the shepherd's candle. To the shepherd's great joy, the angels announced that Jesus came for humble, unimportant people like them too. And in liturgy, the color rose or the purple yeah, signifies joy, pink in our circumstance. And the fourth candle represents peace and is called the angel's candle. The angels announced that Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring people close to God and to each other again. And the fifth candle in the center represents the light and purity and is called Christ's candle. It's placed in the middle and is lit on Christmas Day. Jesus' birth was a miraculous event, but it was only the beginning. It's the beginning of his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And we optimistically wait his return. But we aren't called to be idle until he does. As followers of the Son of God, we should be fiercely professing his supernatural effect on our lives, as well as his eternal promise for a heaven-bound destination, much more than our college football allegiances. <laughs> just, just, I know the CFP is coming out this afternoon, and a lot of you are praying more about where your team's going to show up than if Jesus is coming back. Just saying. But as we walk through the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament during this Advent season, we're going to hear and visualize a prophet who was called by God during one of the toughest times of the kingdom of Israel's existence. Ezekiel's ministry began seven years before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. And his ministry ended 15 years after that event took place. In 597 B.C., Ezekiel's public ministry, his entire public ministry, is carried out in exile. You want to talk about being tough on a pastor. All you're doing is walking the whole time. You've got no place to lay your head or call your home. But despite those outward circumstances, Ezekiel continued to follow his call from God to prophesy about God's sovereignty, his judgment, his mercy, and his kingdom to come. Will spoke last week about God's encouragement for Ezekiel in continuing to spread hope despite the desperate time. 
He mentioned Ezekiel 3, verse 1. Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. We should follow Ezekiel by studying God's word and digesting what God says to us about our daily lives as well as those to whom we influence with our words and our actions when we interact with them. Now I know it sounds hokey and some of you are, saw some of you roll your eyes when I said that at my repetition time and time again about that very same endeavor. But can we honestly do that? Roll our eyes based on our efforts thus far? Although we may be even immersed so much so in God's word, we still will face difficult situations that strain our hope in a brighter future. And it leads me into today's text in Ezekiel 11, verses 13 through 21. If you're looking for Ezekiel, it's in the first chapter half of the book of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament between Lamentations and Daniel. And since this is such a large text, I'm going to be breaking it up in chunks as I always do and just dissect it with you along with the applications. And for some of you, if you, if you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you. There are many that are underneath our chairs. If you don't have one at home, please take it home as a gift from your church at Seawee Bay. We'll have them on the screens. This is just easier for you to follow along as well. But I ask you to follow along with me in Ezekiel 11, verse 13. Now as I was, now as I was prophesying, Belatiah, son of Benaiah, died. And he fell face down. And then I fell face down and I cried out in a loud voice, Alas, sovereign Lord, will you dis completely destroy the remnant of Israel? Now, Ezekiel's been prophesying about the judgment to come through the Babylonian invasion. And he's now seeing more and more effects of God's judgment, including the loss of his friends. And he just has a moment. And he, he gets on his floor, face down, and he just cries out to God and says, Are you just going to wipe us all out? He's lost his country, his friends, and he's professing the destruction of the biggest symbol of their faith, the temple in Jerusalem. I think all of us can relate to Ezekiel a little bit, can't we? We've been in a season in our life where we've been in the throes of just losing it all in our mind. We may have even cried out to God, why me? Why is this happening? And those are some of the most lonely times in our life. But just as quickly as that storm ravages through our lives, we see a sunrise in the horizon. Jesus is recorded in all four of his Gospels where he says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. So what does that mean? Well, God's going to allow some storms to come into your life. More often than not. And it's going to reveal to each of us what our strength or our weakness is in our relationship with him. As well as wash away, remove any sin and any obstacles towards serving his kingdom. And it leads me to your first sermon note. Pursue a faith grounded in God, not people. Pursue a faith grounded in God, not people. I could also put not just a church. In Ezekiel 11 verse 14 it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, the people of Jerusalem have said of your fellow exiles and all the other Israelites, they are far away from the Lord. This land was given to us as our possession. Now Ezekiel's faith in God's ability to speak to him has brought him to the floor. And he's been pleading to God for direction. 
And God answered. God spoke to him. So my question to you is, is do you have that same faith like Ezekiel does in God to answer as he did with Ezekiel? Are you confident in your relationship with God that you can say that wholeheartedly? He answers me. I don't like what he has to say a lot. I'm speaking from my own experience. But I hear him. As we are contemplating that question, I wanted to define faith. This is how the world defines faith. First part. Allegiance to duty or a person. Fidelity to one's promises. Sincerity of intentions. Belief and trust in and loyalty to God. Belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof and complete trust. I read those and they made me angry. I think it's interesting that God is placed in the number two spot based on the world's understanding of faith. I don't see how there can be fidelity to one's promises in this definition, but also be defined as a firm belief in something where there's no proof. So I also want to be very clear in the other definition of the belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion. That means nothing without the relationship of God first. You can do all the great things of a Lord's Supper and a baptism, but if it doesn't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're just going through the motions. We worship a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace. And the traditional doctrines are why we worship Him. Because He set us free. And we do that because it's a form of worship, not to get into heaven. We are already going there. I can remember the day that God spoke to me and moved me out of my seat in a revival in Jackson, Tennessee. Jesus Christ removed the sin of my anger and despair from my heart that day. I remember that so vividly. I could probably take you to the very spot I was standing I can remember God breaking me down in my living room in Mount Pleasant, moving me to apply for seminary. I can remember his voice in taking the lead for the Unity and Community event, as well as his voice on the 4th as I stood all alone that first year in that empty field saying, is it just me and you going to blow up some fireworks? <laughs> And I remember him responding, it is only the beginning. <laughs> Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 3 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith in Jesus Christ is not ignorance. It is not ignorance, but a joyful anticipation of continued revelation of his kingdom to the rest of the world. And during this journey, God has removed many things from my life that were distractions and obstacles for his kingdom. God has probably confronted many of you of these things in order to draw you closer to him as well. Going on in Hebrews 11 verses 32 through 40, you hear of these people. It says, For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They were about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And all of these, it's important you see that in Scripture. And then say some, all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I'd encourage each of you, if you have questions of what faith means through the body of Jesus Christ, go to Hebrews 11 and read it time and time again. It is so rich with encouragement on being faithful. These martyrs were so convicted in God's transformational call in their life and for others that they went to prison. They were stoned. They were deserted. They were killed for the promise of eternity. Taking a little lip from our unbelieving friends on Facebook doesn't sound so bad after all now, right? I want each of you so desperately to have a rock-solid relationship with God that no one or nothing can deter you from sharing his awesome testimony with every man, woman, and child within your reach. Tony Evans, an awesome pastor, theologian, posted this yesterday. Never let the size of your giant determine the size of your God. Let that see, never let the size of your giant or that sin or obstacle that's keeping you determine the size of your God. Siwi Bay is being prepared to recapture God's people in all and all, McClellanville and Hugie for his kingdom. I don't believe that, I know that. He is moving you and I to become more faithful in his power to remove those perceived giants in our lives. So I encourage you to seek his awesome power today and vanquish it for his kingdom to come in your life and the future of his church at Seawee Bay. It brings me to your next sermon note. Pursue a faith that seeks the unseen. Pursue a faith that seeks the unseen. Ezekiel eleven sixteen says, Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I've been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. There's two things in that text I'd like to highlight. First, God tells, him, tells them that he allowed them to be sent away and scattered because of their sin. He allowed that to happen. So that should tell you that God is sovereign over this world and this universe. If you have questions about that, I'd ask you to run on over to Job and see how God interacts with the devil trying to take down Job. Devil can't do anything without God's permission. He allows things to happen within our lives that we can see and even not see. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's also called sanctification. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. May God have mercy on us and allow us to be so kingdom-minded and kingdom-sided to confront those storms in front of us as light, momentary afflictions. In preparation for that eternal weight of his glory beyond all comparison. The Israelites, nor do we observe the protection which we are afforded us on a daily basis. We underestimate those time and time again. 
These people were scattered throughout the world. They were homeless. They were forced to live along many different cultures. They faced, just like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, a fiery furnace at times for their own faith. And the same God who protected those men from any death or burn is protecting us right now. He is timeless and he is here. And when the stuff literally hits the fan in our lives and it may happen with all of our relatives coming soon. I know it's not y'all. Y'all have great families. But I know y'all know other people that have in-laws that may not be so great. I ask each of you just to step back when all that when you see that cloud a coming, just like on Christmas vacation when that doorbell rings. <laughs> At that moment, step back, reflect, and just celebrate that opportunity, just to even fellowship, to celebrate that bickering that you're gonna have. And then that love on even the least of these in our own eyes. I thank God that we woke up this morning. And can even get to see Christmas Day. Have any of you really examined the phenomena of sleeping 8 to 10 hours? Dependent on the amount of turkey you eat, I understand. And then the ability just to wake up? It doesn't make sense. You fall asleep, basically unprotected, and you wake up. But we take that for granted so much. So I ask you to respect those spiritual forces at war around you, which you cannot see. And I praise God for the Holy Spirit to guide us through a minefield on a daily basis. But in order to become more refined and aware of our own spiritual surroundings, we got to humbly submit ourselves to seeking his word daily. Communicating often, not just with him, but with our spouses, with our children, with each other. And then being vulnerable with each other and seeking support. It leads me to your next sermon note. Pursue a faith for God's sake, not ours. Pursue a faith for God's sake, not ours. Here, verses 17 through 21. Therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you've been scattered. I will give you back the land of Israel again. And they will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I'll give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I'll remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And they'll follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I'll bring down on their heads what they've done, declares the sovereign Lord. God tells them that they'll be scattered, covered, and smothered. Some of you got that. I just wanted to check to see if you were listening. <laughs> but although they're scattered, he's going to bring them back. He promises to bring them back and give them the land of Israel once again. He'll bring them back to remove all of the idols of their worship that distance themselves from truly worshiping God individually and corporately as a nation, as a people. And just as we have been changed through the power of acknowledging Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin, God's redeemed in Israel would not have a divided heart any longer. But with a new spirit. It's the same spirit which resides in us. It's, his son, it's what his son professed would come to his disciples when he ascended to his throne. God the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and reveals our purpose in following his decrees and laws. It's called worship. 
James, Jesus' brother, says, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. By the saving grace of Jesus Christ, we desire that people see Jesus Christ within us. And the only way that they see that is through what we say to them and how we interact with them. The redeemed Israelites were changed eternally and obviously lived differently, so much so that God identified them as his people once again. And he professed his kingship over them as well. Our problem is we see God as number two in our life, as the assassin in our times of trouble. We'll call him up to our throne as the kingdom gets tough and we need something. Our sinfulness neglects to inform us that we are the responsible party for the damages. <laughs> Jesus' prayer for his disciples was very specific. We have to come to a place to receive it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, in my house, in my life, as it is in heaven. His kingdom, His will, in our lives, on earth, as it is in heaven. I'd ask you to remember that in your prayers today. May that be the first thing you are reminded of, is that you are speaking to a king of kings who allowed you to wake up today. Ask yourselves, am I really seeking his will or just my answer to be his will too? When he gives his answer and his will, are we going to be faithful enough in his plan to follow through with it? It leads me to your final sermon note. Pursue a faith that shares God's message in word and deed. Ezekiel eleven twenty two through 25 says, Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the exiles in Babylonia and the vision given by the Spirit of God. And the vision I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles everything the Lord had shown me. This is a terrible moment in the nation of Israel's eyes. God's presence and the protection of the temple is no longer with them. And despite that tragic scene, Ezekiel tells the exiles everything. He could have ran like Jonah. When God told him to go to the Ninevites, but he didn't. He could have made numerous excuses like Moses did to avoid confronting Pharaoh, but he didn't. He could have denied God like Peter's three denials, but he didn't. And although it was not the good news of the day, it would be good news someday. <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew 28, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We always remember like verses 18 and 19. We forget that there's a second half where it says teaching them. We typically view this through the lens of evangelism, but it is so much more than that. Making disciples is salvation and sanctification of the body of Jesus Christ. It's walking alongside struggling marriages and seeking reconciliation of God's people and God's covenant among two people. 
It's serving an underperforming school or a struggling community to reflect God's love and acknowledgement of his people from all walks of life. It's confronting our own unspoken sin and getting real with each other in order to remove ourselves as obstacles to God's church within our community. It's the hard stuff that nobody talks about and wants to avoid, but it's also the good stuff because it displays what Jesus Christ is doing within his church body and within our lives. That's why most people call churches hypocrites. It's because the church bodies don't really face and confront their own mistakes and acknowledge them and seek repentance and seek forgiveness with each other. During this season of celebration of our Savior's birth and return, may the biggest present that we receive this year be a transparent and true relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May it be an honest and truthful and open relationship with your Savior to others. You don't want it wrapped in wrapping paper, hidden from others to see. You want to say, here it is. It's messy. It stinks. But it has this glow over it because God has got me covered. We were appointed, each of us were appointed here at Siwi Bay for tremendous things. And God's first priority is redeeming his relationship with every single one of us. I've told you time and time again. It means nothing to me if we grow to be 300 people and have three services. If I lose the relationships and you have weak relationships with Jesus Christ, then I have failed. I want the strongest 40 within this body to be the strongest of any other church within this community. And if I go to my heaven-bound destination and that's all I have, praise be to God you have families and spheres of influences that you can affect for eternity don't worry about everyone else make sure that they are heaven bound or at least have heard the message that's all you can do let God sort out the details you couldn't fix yourself let God do the rest share the message that's it and do it in love in mercy just as you received it from someone who loved you. That's the best present you could give someone. And it is invaluable. You can't get it on Amazon. You can't get it at Walmart. You don't need a Black Friday. It's free. Please share it every day, including this Advent season. Will you begin today? Let's pray.